play to potential. Nugget. And and moving to a different topic, uh, Raj, you talk about you know abundance mindset versus scarcity mindset and mm-hmm. the link with happiness, right? And right. and talk to us a little bit about how you think about these two and the link to happiness. Yeah. So actually, this is a good um, context to talk about this one study that came out. Um, uh, it was summarized in an article in uh, the Atlantic magazine. It came out in 2014, and the um, title of the study, uh, the the pay, the article was the secret fears of the super rich okay secret fears mm-hmm. of the super rich and uh, i believe it was a harvard study um i'm forgetting who conducted it but or, or princeton study but basically they went around interviewing these high net worth individuals okay and in order to qualify as a participant in the study you needed to have 25 million dollars invested in uh, financial instruments right so this are these this is money that's on the side so to speak you know this money invested mm-hmm. in things like hedge funds or um, uh, you know, other kinds of financial instruments is not counting your house, not counting your cars, not counting your other assets. Um, and they interviewed them to ask them, what are some of your big fears? Okay. And one of the biggest fears that these people had is that they don't have enough money. Okay. So wow. um, I, I know it sounds, and it's easy to point fingers at them and say that, you know, I wouldn't be like that. If I had $25 million, you know, I would definitely not be greedy for more money, okay? But we all know that almost at every stage um, in our life, uh, we do end up feeling uh, that, you know, hey, you know what, more money might be actually good for me, okay? And a part of that comes from comparing ourselves to other people. And as you rise up the social ladder, so to speak, um, the company that you keep changes. And so your comparison point changes too. And uh, whereas when I was in India, for example, you know, um, having a kind of swimming pool in my own house might have been like something that, you know, was completely out of reach, right? To where I'm living now, I actually don't have a pool in my house, but I do have a hot tub, okay? Uh, but it doesn't seem like that's out of reach at all, okay? And so right. definitely seems like, oh yeah, if I had enough money, then maybe I can do that. And I can add maybe a little movie theater in my in my house. So why should I have to go out and, um, you know, mingle with the hoi polloi, so to speak? Uh, I can just watch these movies in, your, in my own home, in the comforts of my home and so on. So your, your kind of aspirations catch up, right? So that is a very interesting finding that despite having so much money, these people were, uh, uh, you know, feeling that they didn't have enough. They were operating from a scarcity mindset is how I would, I would put it. Um, and then you have the opposite end of the spectrum that is covered in this movie, uh, this documentary called Happy. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. I think it's still mm-hmm. available on Netflix uh, and you can watch it. Your viewers, your, your uh, uh, you know, whoever's following this podcast can watch it as well. They start out with a scene in the slums of Calcutta um, and the uh, slum dwellers are all people who um, kind of pull rickshaws, right? Uh, you might have seen this. this. These are not like pulley rickshaws, cycle rickshaws. These are hand, rickshaws hand that rickshaws, right? hand, yeah. So they're actually literally running around the city with passengers mm. in their uh, in the seat in their back. Um, and uh, sometimes these people uh, are so um, malnourished uh, that they don't even have um, you know, they have bones sticking out of there and they don't have enough access to resources to wear shoes. So they're running around, bloody feet, uh, read thin. And the uh, researchers go uh, to the slums and interview these people because they're very intrigued by this phenomenon where these people don't even have proper homes to live in. They're, they're living in little slums um, and their homes are basically tarpaulin sheets pulled over few, four sticks with holes in them so that when it rains it's leaky and it's like miserable okay and yet they're all smiling and if not happy at least content and um so the um researchers are kind of flummoxed by this um site and so they go and ask them how how can you afford to be content and happy and uh i'm paraphrasing what they say but they basically say something along the lines of you know what we're taken care of okay we're taken care of and they believe in god or they believe in some kind of a spirit um, and they say that whenever we need anything really desperately, we end up getting it, okay? Maybe not in the way that we conceive of it, uh, maybe not immediately, but we end up getting it. And we have a good sense of community. Uh, everybody in the uh, slums take care of each, uh, takes care of each other. On the days I don't make a good tip, somebody else might make a good uh, tip. And so they feed us. And likewise, we return the favor. And so uh, what to complain about kind of a thing, okay? Um, hmm. So in other words, their life circumstances are characterized by scarcity, Right, not just plain vanilla scarcity, but abject scarcity, and yet they have, if not a mindset of abundance, at least a mindset of contentment. Okay, so 
no prizes for guessing which of these two groups of people is happier, okay? In, in the sense of who needs um, to take antidepressants just to stay afloat, right? Who needs to pop sleeping pills um, to, to fall asleep every night? It's the high net worth individuals, okay? Very, very interesting finding, right? So um, what I talk about um, as an abundance mindset is basically this idea that um, in your head, you feel that um, you have more than enough. And um, it, it, you know, you would think it must be correlated with how much access to resources you actually have, objectively speaking. But in these examples that I just gave you, it appears not to be, okay? Um, and certainly for people like you and me, um, and for people who are listening to this, I would imagine that most of them have enough access to enough resources that right now it's it's a question of whether you you can you can kind of convince yourself that you have enough, right? And you can adopt that mindset of abundance. And if you do, you actually end up discovering. And you know, I have to tell you, Deepak, you know, I, I wasn't somebody who was born with an abundance mindset or, you know, certainly wasn't nurtured in me. And I had to kind of logically figure this out at some level, you know. And and so uh, at one point though, I just decided, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm going to conclude that I have enough and I'm going to operate in a fashion that perhaps is not like as abundance oriented as say Jesus might have been or some other, you know, guru like that might have been or, or even um, people like um, Vinoba Bhave, right, uh, might have been. But I'm going to, in my own way, kind of progress towards a greater and greater abundance. And that is one of the tasks that I've embarked on. And the interesting thing is not only does it make you a happier person, it also makes you more successful, believe it or not. Okay, and uh, to uh, listeners of this, I would really highly recommend a book that I, I, I really loved reading. It's called "Give and Take" by Adam Grant, on how uh, he's kind of you know he cites some three hundred papers in that book. Okay, it came out in two thousand fourteen, oh. bestseller, um, and he basically kind of um, walks you through the logic behind why it is that what he calls givers rather oh. than takers or even matchers are more likely to succeed. OK, and in a nutshell, it has to do with what other people think of you. You know, who would you like to support? Would you like to support a person who's a taker or a giver? Right. So controlling for your quality of work, controlling for how accountable you are, your intelligence, your education and all that, you're much better off being a giver rather than a taker. That is somebody with an abundance mindset rather than a scarcity mindset. And maybe I, I think, that. Yeah, maybe I talk more in answering this question than you wanted me to, but hopefully that was... No, no, I, uh, I love Adam Grant's work as well and the distinction he makes between smart giving and uh, unsmart giving, right? And I, I, I found that nuance extremely profound to say, yeah. and he also says giving is a high beta choice, right? You, If you don't give smartly, you might end up at the bottom of the pile and as a doormat, but yeah. if you're smart, then uh, you could be giving and successful rather than right. a trade-off. So he, he refers to them as otherish givers versus selfish givers. Yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah, uh, lovely. Uh, back to just picking up on the piece you mentioned, uh, Raj. Mm -hmm. How do we, uh, you know, how do we rewire our mindset, right? Uh, and, mm -hmm. and the reason I mention it is when I think about India, a country like India, uh, mm -hmm. where you need there is a certain level of at least the, some of the choices we've made and the path we've taken. It's required us to be competitive, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, a certain uh, edginess often is required by the system for you to get to a certain point. Mm -hmm. And then we suddenly flip the switch to say, you know what, uh, mm -hmm. you need to, uh, you need to change uh, from this. And 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 maybe going back, that edginess requires a certain at least uh, uh, a mindset of uh, scarcity. Saying if you don't make it here, then mm -hmm. this is your, you know, you're missing out on a, a different orbit. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you get to a point, and then uh, you need to you need to behave differently. Uh, with an abundance mindset. Do you see a tension there or a paradox there in terms of uh, how we need to flip the switch at some point and that's hard? Not really, Deepak. Uh, I don't think you need scarcity at all, you know, in my opinion. Uh, I think what you do need is hard work. You need smart work. Uh, you need to identify something that you're intrinsically motivated by. And uh, the scarcity mindset we mistakenly believe is needed for us to uh, put in that hard work. And if I did not have that scarcity mindset, if I did not uh, have this um, feverish desire desire to um, overcome my circumstances and get out of uh, you know the hellhole I'm in. Um, I'm not going to succeed. Okay, uh, and mm -hmm. I don't think that that uh, negativity, that insecurity, stress, anxiety, etc., is needed at all. Um, huh. I think if you love what you do, uh, you can very easily motivate yourself through that love. 
rather than through that feeling of scarcity. I do think that there are certain contexts in which scarcity mindset is very useful. Um, if you're in a war zone, if you are, you know, uh, in a, say even in a slum, like the slum that I talked about, uh, perhaps, okay? But uh, if you're in a middle-class family and what you're, end up, what you're going to end up doing is not fighting like in a war, physical fighting, but you're going to do intellectual work, creative work, uh, I don't think the scarcity mindset is needed at all. And I don't know if you know this about Adam Grant, right? One of his you know, stories is um, that he um, was a diver, right? And he was pretty good. Um, and he got to the level where he was competing at the national level. And uh-huh. in one of the national competitions, uh, the, the final one uh, for the gold medal and stuff like that, he noticed his competitor um, doing some mistake, okay? And he was wondering whether to go tell him that, you know, if you just correct for this, you're going to actually be much better. And um, he thought, okay, if I do that, maybe I know I'm going to help him and I'm going to sacrifice my own gold medal, but um, it's fine. You know, I'll go tell him. And I did that. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. The other guy got the gold and Adam himself got the silver medal. The next Mm -hmm. year comes around and exactly the same thing happens with another guy. Okay. But he goes ahead and again, bites the bullet and tells the other guy that if you just do this, you're going to be a much better diver. And the other guy ends up winning the gold again. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Adam decides that, well, you know, two times it's hurt me uh, being a giver. Um, so I, I want to kind of focus on on this topic and research it. So he ended up uh, not, not going down the diving route, but uh, ended up becoming a professor after pursuing a PhD. And what he found is that givers in the long run um, end up succeeding. Okay. In the short run, Sure, you know, you help other people out, you prop them up, you know, they climb over your shoulders and and go ahead, right? Especially if they're takers, they're not going to help you back up, okay? But in the long run, particularly in the kind of environment in which we live now, a lot of social media and things like that, word gets around, um, you're much, much better off being a giver, okay? Um, Again, I mean, I, I want to kind of point this out, that being insecure, being anxious, being jealous, envious of other people and being scarcity minded can certainly light a fire under your backside to motivate you to do things. Okay. And that can lead to success, but that success is going to come at a huge cost to your well-being, and perhaps even to your long-term success. It's much better to be on a solid or much better platform of loving what you do, being nice to other people. And um, I think that you'll see that not only does it make you a happier person, it also makes you a much more successful person in the long run. Thank you for listening. For more, please visit playtopotential.com.